Okay, so I normally don't make social commentary, cultural commentary. I normally don't get into the culture wars. But this one I thought, oh man, this is a good opportunity to learn to think theologically. So it's pretty interesting. Pretty interesting. I, I listened to a Lutheran pastor, and I might provide the link uh, on this topic of uh, transcendent rebellion. And then I listened to an evolutionary biologist talk about this subject. And I'm not so interested in just the micro issue of sexual dysphoria, of you know picking one of the dysphorias, but I'm much more interested in uh, the broader issue of sexual dysphoria. Uh, and of course, I realize, you know, if I talk about this and if I post this on YouTube, it's going to be up there forever. And when I run for president, this is going to come back to haunt me. And I'm like, oh man, maybe I shouldn't do it. So if I'm ever running for president and if I ever get elected president, uh, my, my political opinion on the issue of, you know, all of these sexual dysphorias and the law is that the law should really stay out of the whole business altogether. Uh, I am very much a voluntarist. Uh, I believe that the government should really not get involved except for when people violate property or violate contracts between people. Uh, you know, that's my basic job. So uh, when I'm president, that's what I will do. And I won't have anything to say on this subject as president whatsoever. I'm talking about this kind of as a pastor thinking, you know, how do we think through the, these issues? You know, some thoughts on thinking about sexual dysphoria. Uh, so preliminary thoughts. Preliminary thoughts. Uh, I think the three people who are going to watch this video are all Christians. And so here's kind of how I hear Christians talk about this issue. Uh, they sound like judgmental jerks. They sound like hypocritical jerks, and they sound like self-righteous jerks. That is, they point the fingers at others and say, oh, you're committing this sin. Meanwhile, we kind of avoid our own sexual sins and say that, you know, like we're good and holy and righteous, uh, which also, which makes us judgmental, hypocritical, self-righteous jerks. And I don't want to sound that way. I don't want to be that way. And, uh, Admittedly, I'm more than a little disturbed when Christians sound that way. So, hey, if you're a Christian, am I hearing you correctly when I say you sound like jerks? Uh, so uh, one of the giveaways for me, and this was with the Lutheran pastor I listened to, and I highly respect this guy. He's just a brilliant thinker, and he's so eloquent, and he does his research, unlike this, which I tried to put all this together, uh, but it's certainly not as well thought out on my first go round as I would like it to be. Uh, but anyway, a couple of the mistakes I think he made in this is uh, he made some snide comments. Uh, he made some jokes at the expense of um, people who disagree with him. Uh, so snarky comments, snide comments, all of those are giveaways to me that you are a judgmental, hypocritical, self-righteous jerk or one of those three. So instead, what I would like to do is for, if you disagree with me, I, I want to honor you. I want to respect you. I want to love you. I, I want to be curious and go, hey, why do you disagree with me? Uh, let me explore so that I can say to you back, you know, hey, is this your position? And you say, yes, that's exactly what I think. Uh, and then I can say, okay, now let's talk about how we can how we disagree and why we disagree. And if we end up disagreeing, that's fine. Uh, I simply want to come to a point of understanding, uh, even if neither of us are convinced by the other person's argument. Uh, that's what I call respectful. That's what I call tolerance. I do not call it to be tolerant when you're allowed to have no other opinion uh, but mine. Yeah. Yeah. You're being tolerant when you agree with me. That, that's not what I call tolerant or vice versa. Next topic. All right, uh, dysphoria and the Tau. Uh, I believe this is our general human condition and it's about everything, not just sexual dysphoria. So uh, I, I, 
I'm not going to give you the dictionary or psychological definition of dysphoria. Uh, this is my general understanding of dysphoria, the feeling of incongruence between one's identity and externals or between one's feelings and the stuff around you. Okay, uh, this could be with regard to your sexual identity. It could be regard to your identity and the people around you. Uh, but it, you know, it gets that feeling. It's like something is amiss here. Something is out of alignment here. You know, within me or without me. You know, inside me or outside me. Something is out of alignment. Okay, that's what I mean by dysphoria. Uh, the the Tao and Tao is spelled T-A-O, and it is pronounced Dao, as if it's with a D. I don't know why, but that's how I've always heard it pronounced. Uh, if you read C.S. Lewis, The Abolition of Man, he talks about the Dao, and I'm, I'm kind of of the opinion that all of us feel dysphoria, and all of us feel out of alignment with the Dao. So the Dao, uh, this is dictionary.com, the absolute principle of underlying the universe, combining within itself the principles of yin and yang, and signifying the way that is in harmony with the natural order. And it's that natural order that I'm concerned with is, you know, there's this idea that there is this reality that is true and good and beautiful. And we all want to be in harmony with what's true and with what is good and with what is beautiful. Because when we're in alignment, when we're in alignment with what is true and good and beautiful, we tend to be happier, we tend to be more fulfilled. And so we all want to be in alignment with the Tao. Okay. Uh, now we can argue about the source of the Tao, uh, but let's just call the source of the Tao God. And whatever you choose as the source of the Tao, uh, I'll leave that between you and if you want to have a discussion, we can argue about the source of the Tao, but let's just acknowledge that there's a Tao. Uh, there's this ideal out there of what is true and good and you know, beautiful, okay? Uh, it's just the underlying order of the universe, okay? So that's the Tao, source of the Tao, we can just call, you know, quote unquote, God whatever God you may choose. So what happens when you're out of alignment with the Tao? What changes? So, so in other words, uh, you know, I feel one way, but here's, but I butt up against, you know, externals. Okay. So let me give, let me give an example. Okay. We'll, we'll come to this later, but you know, I have a mouth and with regard to food, uh, the purpose of my mouth is fairly obvious, okay? You know, I, I can chew, I can swallow, and that leads me to digest. And if I eat something that is healthy and nourishing, then I myself am nourished. And so I think we would say that eating wholesome, nourishing, real food, real food, you know, stuff that comes from the ground and stuff that comes from animals, is, is is wholesome and nourishing. It's in alignment with the Tao. Of course, there are some people, or so I'm told, who have a desire, an urge to eat something that comes from an animal, from their from their poop. I think there's an actual psychological condition like this. Uh, so they have this desire to eat feces. Now, you and I would look at that and go, oh, that's out of alignment with the Tao. That's exactly what you think when someone says, I have a desire to eat feces. Ah, oh, you're out of alignment with the Tao. I'm sure that's your first thought. But nonetheless, we'll go, ah, there's something wrong here. So what needs to change? Do I say, well, I just need the poop to become healthy and nourishing, and I need you to make poop that's healthy and nourishing so I can eat it? Or do I say, oh, my feelings, my desires are wrong, and I need to change my feelings. Now, with regard to the desire to eat poop, I hope we're all in agreement about what needs to change. Uh, but what if it's something else? Uh, you know, I could go on a rampage, my 
anti-added sugar rampage and say, you know, uh, it's not real food if you're adding sugar to it. Uh, you know, you need to change your desires and eat real food. Uh, and we can have that argument uh, all day long. Uh, but what happens when I'm desiring things that are out of alignment with the Tao? And so we can talk about this with our sexual feelings as well. You know, if, if I desire a woman and she is my wife, is that in alim alignment with the Tao? If I'm desiring um, sexual relations with another man or with multiple women or have no sexual desires whatsoever, or if I feel like I am a woman and not a man, or if I feel like I'm not manly enough, uh, there's a dysphoria there and something's out of alignment. So what needs to change? So if I can say there's, there's kind of two realities here, there's kind of the physical reality, and then there's my internal feelings and desires. Which one of those is the authority? That's, to me, part of the crux of the issue when it comes to being out of alignment of my internal feelings, my internal consciousness, my identity, and physical reality. Okay, Those are the two things that we're up against. Which one of those is the authority? Next slide. So when we're talking about uh, sexuality, uh, you know, if you go to the Dark Horse podcast with an evolutionary biologist, he has a great episode on this, and I might might possibly put a link to it. Uh, but anyway, he has strong opinions, and he is definitely not religious, definitely not Christian. He makes a big point in saying, this is not Christian. This is not religious. Uh, he's just making observations. And so I, I took a, a class. It, it wasn't called sociobiology. Uh, but I only lasted two weeks and it just drove me nuts. But oh man, was it good. Uh, a good primer, I think is how they pronounce that word, a good primer on sociobiology. So I learned a lot and, and uh, I keep hearing more and more about this. And so, uh, you know, I think we, you know, nature and the Bible agree on sociobiology sexual tactics. So here are the sociobiological -bio tactics for a male. A male has two, two sexual tactics because from an evolutionary point of view, uh, a male's goal is to reproduce his biological genetic material, okay? So option number one is the option chosen by animals. Uh, animals, every male, well, not every, uh, most most males, okay, a lot of males, animals, uh, it, their goal is to place their seed in as many fertile, young, healthy females as they possibly can, okay? That is the tactic. Uh, it, it, it requires, you know, for male humans, it requires an evening of wooing and winning a woman placing their seed inside of them, and then making themselves scarce, uh, which is why it's generally advised to women, why I keep hearing the advice, you know, women, if you give in to this tactic, men will go, oh, she's low quality. Maybe I can plant my seed into her, because he's actually thinking this. Maybe I can plant my seed into her, and she can bear an offspring for me with no investment on my part. Uh-huh. I'm sure that's what he's actually thinking. Uh, no, he's just driven to that by whatever biology, or as Christians would say, by sin, that is a distortion of humanity. Uh, the other tactic is the only tactic that women can have, which is uh, a male can say, oh, I'm going to choose this one female, this one female, and the male female would say, I'm going to choose this one man, and I'm going to invest myself heavily in, in this person. Uh, the man says, no one's going to sleep with my wife. And the woman says, this man's not going to sleep with any other woman. He's going to invest himself in me and my children. Uh, it's why I say, you know, the best advice I have for any man, the greatest gift you can give to a woman is to... Uh, yeah, sorry. The greatest gift you can give to your children is to love their mother. 
Did I say that right? Okay. Uh, the greatest gift a man can give to a woman is to love her children. Uh, and it's even better if they're his children. Now, again, we're talking about the Tao. There are plenty of exceptions. You know, there's plenty of instances where, you know, children who are not in the uh, biological children of their mother and father or grow up without a mother or father uh, who turn out well. And there are plenty of children who have, you know, who grow up in their the house of their biological father and mother who turn out very badly. But I think, I'm pretty sure, the sociological statistics, uh, personal experience, you'll agree with me that, you know, the healthiest way from both a sociobiological perspective and from a Christian perspective and from a societal perspective is when a man and a woman commit to each other in a lifelong relationship, you know, and have each other's children and raise each other's children, uh, that is the healthiest situation uh, for children and for society as a whole. Now, what happens if a male chooses the first option? Okay, that is to sleep around, you know, be what I would call a cad. Uh, so, so I think this is interesting. This is interesting because there are all these tactics that I kind of go, wow, that's really out of alignment with everything. So... <laughs> Uh, so men will sleep with a woman who's not fertile because she's on the pill. Uh, they'll sleep with a woman in any, almost any and every situation where they, they possibly can. Uh, and I'm going, okay, but you're not passing on your genetic material. Uh, or a man will pay for an abortion. And I'll go, but you're not passing on your genetic material if you kill the baby. Wouldn't you want the baby to survive? doesn't make sense to me. Uh, pornography, uh, another example where uh, that sexual tactic makes no sense to me from a sociobiological perspective. No sense whatsoever, uh, except that men have this compulsive need to look at young fertile women, and then it becomes more and more out of, out of whack with the Tao, with reality, uh, when, when uh, money gets involved with pornography especially. And will pay all sorts of money to look at women and to put their seed somewhere other than inside a woman. So uh, let's let's go to feminism and female and the results for a female. Uh, by the way, the results for a man who does this, who acts like a cat and sleeps around, uh, the result is he becomes an animal and not a human. Because a human, the best tactic for himself or his wife or his kids, uh, the best tactic is a lifelong committed marriage. It's just the, the best tactic. Uh, again, science says so, the Bible says so. I, I'm going, okay, we got to be in agreement on this, right? Yeah, maybe not. So it's interesting, uh, along comes science, and science invents the pill, which frees women from the connection between sex and fertility. Uh, it, it breaks the connection between sexual intercourse and, and conception. You know, something that was in the past, you know, integrally connected, you know, just part and parcel is sexual relations would result in conception, conception would result in birth. These are a whole out of the love between a man and a woman they engage in sexual relations, a child is conceived, a child is born, a child is raised. What the pill it does is freeze the sexual act from conception. And then what abortion does is it frees a woman from conception of a child from the birth of a child. And then divorce frees a woman from this lifelong committed relationship with a man, which allows a woman to be just like a man, uh, and sleep around and not spread any seed. And the results are interesting. Because again, sociologically speaking and biblically speaking, the results for women do not appear to me to be good for women. 
In fact, when I look at what the pill does and abortion does and divorce does, is it turns a woman into a man. Or, as I was saying before, it turns her into an animal, just like the man. And the interesting thing is, she becomes infertile. So we're going we're gonna to come back to this maybe uh, just with the idea of vocation. I would think that what feminism would celebrate, would extol, are the female distinctives rather than trying to turn a woman into a man and to, you know, turn men into what I would call manly men, you know, men who love their wife and love their wife's children. That's what I would call a manly man. Uh, but instead, feminism has apparently turned women into men who are animals. And, and I don't get it. I just don't get it. And so if you try to transcend your humanity, you know, women who, I don't know if you notice this, but females, they're the only ones who can conceive a child. Only females are able to give birth. Only females are able to suckle their children. And what I keep seeing is with science and society, we tend to celebrate ripping that away, those female distinctives away from women. Hey, look, you're a female. You don't have to conceive. You don't have to give birth. You don't have to suckle. And I, I believe it's only the Roman Catholics who've stood up and said, no, you're not allowed to do that. Uh, we Lutherans say, oh, well, if you're married, you can decide to do that. Uh, so I, I think it's interesting when we try to transcend our humanity, we end up being infertile. Next slide. Okay, so I, I found this to be helpful. This is uh, the first of a, a asex bell curve, and I got this on the, off the internet, so I assume this is you know true and accurate. And, and so what I want you to notice is these two bell curves. You know, you got the pink feminine bell, female bell, bell curve and the male bell curve, the blue one. Uh, and the, I want you to notice two things. Uh, one is the male bell curve is flatter and wider. And the female bell curve is narrower and higher. That is, more women tend to cluster in the middle of the bell curve. And men tend to, to flatten out. Uh, and so I, I think what a couple of things, I, so I think that's interesting about these two bell curves. And, and then the other part is uh, where they, they have those, the, the pink area under the blue and the, the blue area under the pink. And they talk about men with female, quote unquote, female height. And they go, oh, that is so bad. And then they talk about women with male height. So women who are on the extreme right of the bell curve, you know, you're a woman with male height. That is so bad. And then the, the poor guys who are shorter, uh, you know, they're, they have female height. It's like, oh man, see, that's where we run into problems, I think, with this whole thing. When we start talking about, you know, sex and gender. Uh, so let, let me go to the next Next slide, yeah. Uh, so I just made this slide up. It, 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 I think it kind of corresponds with reality though. The curves are gonna be shifted one way or the other depending on the topic. So as we saw with height, you know, the, the red one would shift to, it would shift to the left, yeah, relative to the man. And then there's other areas where it would shift to the right. I don't know what those are. Uh, but the reason I the reason I have this so uh, the red is represents females you know those with X Y chromosomes those with a womb uh, and the the blue represents males. Uh, now we could we could say with re just regard to maleness and femaleness that men and women are on these bell curves as well. Uh, that is to say, uh, there are men who are more male than other men if we want to talk that way as the last graph kind of showed, uh, you know, there are men who have, you know, broader shoulders, you know, they're six foot two, 210 pounds, they've got 
broad shoulders and square chins and narrow hips and they whatever run really fast and they can beat you up or something uh they're more male and then there are females who are oh i was going to show a picture of you know thor <laughs> Uh, and then there's there are the kind of the female ideals, uh, you know, they're more female. And I, I think that is fairly well culturally determined, though. There are some aspects of femaleness that are cross-cultural, uh, particularly those uh, shown with fertility. But what I really find interesting about this it has to do with gender. Now, gender is an interesting thing because as far as I'm aware, the, the phrase gender comes from language. So you would have the feminine, la montagna, uh, or you would have the masculine, el gato, as if a cat is male and a mountain is female, except if you look at various languages, you're going to find no consistency. You know, a mountain is female, a feminine, and a mountain is masculine. But the way we use the term masculine and feminine have to do with propensities that we have associated with sex. So we've associated masculinity with males and femininity with females. Uh, and I'm okay with propensities and say, oh, you know, Boys have these propensities and girls have those propensities. And so, you know, if you give a boy a Barbie doll, what is he going to do with it? Versus what happens if you give a girl a Tonka truck? What is she going to do with it? Uh, and, and you'll notice propensities, but it bothers me. It very much bothers me when we'll say to, you know, a boy who has feminine propensities and we'll go, that's not right or something. And I go, well, you know, just depending on the curve, you know, you're going to have, uh, you know, males who are all over the place, you know, on one side of the bell curve or on the other side of the bell curve. And so, you know, males who enjoy what most girls like or girls who enjoy what most boys like. And so do we need to call a boy feminine or can we just say he's a boy who likes these things and she's a girl who likes playing with the boys. Uh, is that okay? Or do we have to call her a tomboy? Anyway, my, my whole point is uh, when we don't allow people to, to, you know, when we mix in this whole gender stuff, uh, you know, how do you feel on the inside? I see problems with it rather than going, you know, sure, my, my insides are, you know, different than what you associate with maleness or what, what other people associate with femaleness and whatever the propensities are, we have a broad range, a broad range of broad variety within males and females and just go, you know what? That's okay, except when it's out of alignment with the Tao. And that's the question we have to ask. At what extreme are we out of alignment with the Tao? Anyway, I found this to be helpful uh, because you know, in the quote unquote good old days, which I don't think were nearly so good, uh, uh, you know, some boys would be making fun of another boy and go, you throw like a girl, maybe you're a girl. And the boy would go to the teacher and go, oh, they're calling me a girl. Uh, you know, and in the past, you know, she would go up to the, the bullies and she would go, you're being bullies. He's a boy. You can tell he's a boy. So quit making fun of him and calling him a girl. But nowadays, the boy comes up to the teacher and says, they're calling me a girl. And the teacher says, well, maybe you are. Uh, now, I don't say that. I don't say that to be funny. I, I say it because it's like, whoa, whoa. Uh, you know, you can be a male and have all sorts of wide variety of differences as far as, you know, masculinity or so-called femininity goes. All right, so here's kind of how I see it, you know, in alignment with what the Bible teaches. You know, when we recognize our creatureliness that God has made us, we become co-creators with the creator. When we recognize our creatureliness, we become co-creators. However, if we decide for ourselves and say, oh, no, 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 I am a God, 
I decide for myself. I don't need God, so I'm going to play the role of the God. I'm going to be the source of the Tao. In other words, that's what I mean by a God. You're saying, I'm the source of the Tao, or this ideology or that ideology is the source of the Tao. This is what defines reality. We end up becoming infertile. In other words, the opposite of a creator. So Genesis chapter 1, God creates Adam, uh, the human, and he creates the human male, and he creates the human female. Male and female, he created them. In his image, he created them, and he says, be fruitful and multiply. Note that. Note that. Male and female are only fruitful and multiply when they are male and female and when they are creator. He says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and have dominion over the land and the animals. And so humans were created to be fruitful and to multiply as male and female. And I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, what happens when we cease to be male and female? Uh, and when we try to have dominion over other people, rather than having dominion and co-create with God over the land and the animals. And people always ask me, what, what do you mean by that? Uh, well, when people domesticate animals, they're co-creating with God. They're bringing order to a chaotic world. Uh, when we when we develop the land, when we plant seeds, uh, when we landscape, when we make things even more beautiful than what what nature made them, we are co-creating with God because we're in alignment with the Tao. That is, we're exercising dominion by serving, by creating order, by creating what's true and good and beautiful. That's the image of God. Okay, that's Genesis chapter one. Okay, you with me so far? Then we, we come, then we come to Genesis chapter 2. Uh, it was not good that the man be alone. Uh, the human, the human male. It was not good that he was alone. So God brought him a female human, and he burst forth into poetry because no animal could serve the role of companion. Uh, that word, it, it has to do with someone who's corresponding to him. And the female corresponds to the male so that male and female are called to co-rule and have co-dominion with God and co-create with God as male and female. Uh, and we cannot do that with the animals. Can't do that with the land. We're called to rule over the land and the animals. Uh, we can't rule over other human beings, but we can rule with human beings as male and female. We can be fruitful, we can multiply, we can fill the earth. Adam sees Eve and he breaks forth into poetry and says, this at last is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. I like to say, whoa, man. <laughs> uh, for she was taken out of man or something like that. I, uh, you know, so far, the only way we can have life, you know, new life, the creation of new human beings, is one male and one female coming together in sexual union. Now, science is advancing amazingly so that you know new human beings can be created outside of the human body apart from the act of sex, sexual intercourse. Uh, and, and maybe one day it'll happen that a male can actually be completely and totally transitioned uh, from male to female. You know, a womb be placed inside of him. Uh, and I don't know what all the female body parts are, uh, but a man, a male be given all the female body parts. Uh, and this transitioned male to female uh, will, will actually be able to conceive and give birth to a child. But right now, right now, uh, when, you know, it's, uh, as Pastor Wolf Miller says, you know, there's kind of two mountains, you know, you're either male or female. Uh, there are, there are exceptions. I think it's like one in 10,000 or one in 100,000 where a person is, is born neither male nor female, uh, you know, XY chromosome, XX chromosome. If something gets messed up in the process of 
developing a, a baby, uh, you know, a person can be born with, you know, one X chromosome and nothing else, or X, X, Y, and I think X, X, X. Uh, and such people, you know, one in 10,000, one in 100,000, uh, something like that, uh, are neither male nor female. But I think we all recognize that such people, uh, what would we say? We, we'd say they have an accidental characteristic that was a mistake. Uh, they're still human, but there's something wrong. Uh, and this is what I mean by sexual dysphoria. There's something wrong with every single one of us because we do things like men look at pornography and become infertile. Uh, men try to sleep around and what happens? They end up causing disease and despair and heartache and heartbreak. They act like animals uh, and eventually they become infertile and alone and unloved. Uh, and that's Genesis 3 and the curse, where Adam and Eve were given a choice. They were given a choice of you can learn the difference between good and bad. That is, you can learn the Tao from, from either God or a magic tree. And they chose to learn the Tao, learn what's good and what's bad from a magic tree, which is to say, we've got this. We can take care of this ourselves. And there you have the curse. The work of men, it, it becomes frustrating and toilsome, burdensome labor. Uh, you know, we're, we're confronted with weeds and just all sorts of nastiness. And all the work that we do, it's so frustrating. It's so hard. I wonder why women want to go into the workforce, you know, the paid workforce, uh, when it's such toilsome, burdensome labor. You know, women have a hard enough time in this world because the curse of woman is greatly multiplied pain in childbirth, and then this tense relationship with men, you know, depending on your desire shall be for your husband and he will rule over you or what, however you translate that and whatever that means, there's going to be this conflict uh, between husband and wife. And, and that curse leads to infertility. The land becomes infertile and men and women become infertile. Uh, in fact, uh, there was a time during the Roman Empire uh, Caesar Augustus was concerned with the declining fertility rate because guess what men and women were doing? They were sleeping around and having sexual relations with everyone but their spouse. And it le led to declining birth rates. And so he tried to make some laws that would increase that. Uh, so uh, what I see is when we're out of conformity with the Tao, when we don't recognize our maleness and our femaleness, we end up becoming infertile. And I think you see that, you know, with, with transgendered humans, uh, men who have sex with men, women who have sex with women, uh, with, with men who try to become women, women who try to become men. Uh, and even if we can get to the point scientifically where we're actually able to, you know, take a male and change all of his XY chromosomes into XX chromosomes and actually give him a womb and give him breasts and give him all the female body parts. And even if somehow science is able to transcend that, have we truly become gods? Maybe that's what some people long for, you know, to become transhuman. I don't know, but I'm looking at it and going, whoa, we're, it seems to me we're out of alignment with the Tao. That is with reality. And what needs to change, I would think, is my identity and my feelings to be in conformity with the Tao. Next slide. Okay. So I thought this was helpful from Pastor Wolf Mueller, you know, purpose versus meaning and significance. You know, the purpose of something is somewhat obvious. The meaning or significance is not so obvious. It has to be revealed, though. Some people are really good at kind of discovering it. So I talked about your mouth. You know, the, the purpose of your mouth is, is fairly obvious as far as food goes. You know, it's like you have this feeling of hunger and then you see food and you take that food and you chew on it and you swallow it. And 
look at that, your hunger goes away. You know, the purpose of your mouth is fairly obvious. You know, you get hungry, you eat food, your hunger goes away, and look, you stay alive. Whereas if you're feeling hungry long enough, you die. Okay, so the purpose of your mouth but what's the, what's the meaning, what's the significance of your mouth with regard to food? God gives you a certain amount of enjoyment of your food. The purpose is not, you know, not so that we live to eat, but so that we eat to live, as some people say. Again, that would be meaning. We, we eat so that we may truly live, we may truly have life. And can we enjoy what I would really like of people is that we learn to enjoy real food, food that grows from the ground, uh, you know, not food that where the, you know, all the good stuff is taken out and all sorts of bad stuff is put in a uh, lot more convenient, a lot more tasty, uh, but then we lose our taste for real food. But the point being is we have these organs and they have a purpose. And the purpose, again, is somewhat obvious, but the meaning gets missed because food, it ties us together. It binds us together in community. Food gives us joy and satisfaction. We have banquets where we eat and enjoy one another's company and we celebrate. And food is a chance for the family to get together and communicate and say, hey, what was your high today? What was your low today? What made you sad today? What made you laugh today? Did you help somebody today? All that is around food. Because food has great meaning and significance. And we can discover that to a degree. Or it can be revealed to us from the source of the Tao, from God, from God's word. So when it comes to our sexual organs, then, the purpose, again, is pretty obvious. The male sexual organs work together with the female sexual organs to produce another child. But what is the meaning and significance of that? And again, science helps us out a bit and can go, oh, look at that. And especially for a woman, when a woman has sexual relations with a man, she tends to fall in love with him. If she does so too quickly, the man tends to fall out of love with her because he goes, well, this ain't a prize if she's sleeping with every guy this quickly. Um, uh, sexual relations, it binds two people together in love and harmony when they do it within the context of marriage, a lifelong commitment and lifelong loyalty. It, it has that extra glue that is what the Bible calls the one flesh union. The two are one flesh. Let no man, let no human divide what God has brought together. There's a meaning and significance beyond just its purpose. It is truly transcendent and not transcendent rebellion. You're not rebelling against the purpose. And so again, this is where I, uh, you know, when, when your inner identity and your inner reality are out of sync with the obvious purpose of your sexual organs, there's something wrong, I would say. And you can say, I'm going to change my organs. Uh, or you can say, I need to change my identity or shove that identity. You know, I need to suppress that, suppress my identity because it's out of alignment with the Tao. And that's the question that I'm asking. You know, uh, because I definitely noticed this in other men, definitely not in myself. You know, when other men, you know, do things like, you know, desire other women, lust after them, you know, not fully love and care for their wife uh, and give her pleasure. Uh, you know, when other men do that, you know, when they fail to do what they should and when they get involved with, you know, trying to chase women around, uh, they're out of alignment, not just with the purpose of their sexual organs, uh, but with the significance and meaning of them, which is to bind them together with their spouse. Okay? Hoping that makes sense. Makes sense up here in my mind. Getting it out is another story. So I'd love to get feedback on this. Now we come to the issue of mysticism and, and Gnosticism. So... <laughs> Uh, so, uh, 
we we in the Christian church tend to talk about, you know, um, body and spirit, you know, our material being and our spiritual being. Um, and I would tend to emphasize not that these are two things, but that they are one whole, uh, that we are body and spirit. We are a united whole. You know, the spirit, our, the breath that we breathe and our body, uh, those two things make us a whole human being. And if you rip those two apart, you're no longer human, you're dead. Okay, uh, so what mysticism does and Gnosticism does is says, you, you know, your material body is bad. What mysticism does is say your soul or your spirit is good. And if you can, if you can escape from this prison, which is your body, then you can truly become who you were meant to be. Whereas in Christianity, we say who you were meant to be is this created being with your body and your spirit that keeps your body alive. That's who you are. Now, it's been corrupted by sin. You know, your spirit, you're spiritually corrupted. You're physically corrupted. We have all sorts of things wrong with our bodies, all sorts of things wrong with our spirit, our will, our mind, our emotions are all corrupted by sin. But one day, God is going to remove that corruption, and we will become fully human. Why we confess in the church, I believe in the resurrection of the body, because we were not made for this world. We were not made so that we would die, but so that we'd find our life in God, the source of the Tao, the source of what is true and good and beautiful. Uh, and so we look at ourselves as being embodied creatures. The mystic and the Gnostic believe that we will find our true life and true self by being disembodied. And so if you look at your sexual organs, go, those aren't the right ones. Uh, or, you know, you go against the purpose of your organs and use them for things other than, you know, conception and binding together husband and wife. Uh, then you're out of alignment with the Tao. You're out of line with their obvious purpose and maybe not so obvious meaning and significance. Uh, same thing if you look at your organs and say, I need to chop them off. I need to become something that I am physically not because that mystically, Gnostically, is who I truly am. Gnosticism and mysticism goes way back and Pastor Wolfmuller in his uh, Theology of Pronouns is the name of his episode. Uh, and again, I disavow all of his snarky comments, both of his snarky comments and jokes that he makes. Uh, the rest I'm pretty good with. Uh, uh, this, this Gnosticism and mysticism goes way back. Uh, you know, men, ca priests who pra pra castrate themselves uh, and become transcendent. Uh, and again, what happens when we become transcendent, when we transcend our humanness, is we either become animals or we become infertile. We stop being co-creators. And so uh, Romans 1, we do not thank God so much for the gift as for the giver of the gift. And why, again, I think the source of the Tao, not just the Tao is important, uh, because if you want to be a Taoist, you know, I, I imagine if you subscribe to that philosophy of the Tao, uh, you'll have a more happy and fulfilled life than, you know, a lot of Christians I know who are self-righteous, judgmental, hypocritical jerks. But I shouldn't talk about myself that way. Uh, yeah, if you subscribe to the Tao, but what you're missing is the giver of the Tao, the source of the Tao. And so we thank God not so much for the gift as for the giver of the gift. And so in Romans 1, it, it says, you know, they, they, they threw away the glory of God. That is the way God made us, male and female. And he, and he gave them desires. He gave them over to these desires that are not according to the purpose of their maleness and the purpose of their females. They threw away the glory and failed to give thanks to God. And so, you know, I've learned that when my wife gives me healthy, wholesome, nourishing food, I say, thank you. I don't say, give me garbage that tastes good. I say, thank you for giving me wholesome, nourishing food. When I was younger, I would say, give me garbage. Give me food that tastes good. 
And so, you know, if my mom would give me a cookie, I would go, oh, thanks, mom. You love me so much. But when she would give me <clears throat> um, almost any vegetable matter, I, I would I would just refuse to eat it because I was an ungrateful little, because I failed to recognize the goodness of the giver when she fed me real food. But if I truly am thankful for the giver and my mom, or now what I truly do, I'm thankful for the giver because she feeds me real food. She feeds me good food. And how much more if God gives me my body and I recognize the purpose of my body and the significance and meaning of my body, I go, God, you're a good giver. I'm not so appreciative of the gifts sometimes, especially when you give me pain or you give me desires that are out of conformity with the Tao. Uh, I'm not so thankful. And I go, oh, why can't this be okay? How can something that feels so good be bad? And the answer is, because God is a good giver, he knows what we need. Which then leads us to the, the final thing, the, the real gift that God gives us, the, the gracious giving God. Uh, he, he does not come and go, hey, you know, do you want me to make you whole? Here, let me snap my fingers and perform a magic trick on you uh, and, and make you whole. Uh, what he does is he joins us in our human corruption. The word becomes flesh. The word of God becomes flesh and makes his dwelling among us. Merry Christmas. And he takes on our suffering, he takes on our humanity, and he shows what it's like to be truly and fully human so that we may become truly and fully human. He's not so concerned with your behavior as your desire. Do you want the giver? Do you want the source of the Tao? Or do you just want God to snap his fingers and make you happy? You know, to conform reality to your desires or to snap his fingers and take away your bad desires. No, no, what, he, what he's doing is training you in righteousness, you know, being rightly aligned with the Tao by sending you dysphoria. When you feel out of alignment with reality, you feel out of alignment with yourself, you feel out of alignment with your identity, where are you going to turn? And the answer is, you can turn to the Tao, you can turn to your spouse, you can turn to, you know, the Democrats or the Republicans, uh, you can turn to this philosophy or that philosophy, or you can turn to the one true God as he's revealed in the person of Jesus. And you can go, there it is. There's the Tao, and there's the source of the Tao. I want to conform my life to him, and that's an incredibly painful process because I'm continually butting up against the Tao that is truly against the source of the Tao, I'm butting against reality. The goal being is I want to align myself with reality, that is, with God, because God is the source of all that's true and good and beautiful. That's the way I'm looking at it. Uh, and so I want to help other people recognize that, yeah, you're feeling out of alignment with the Tao because you're out of alignment with the Tao. And the only solution is to turn from that and align yourselves with God, that is with Jesus, which is, that is with his death and resurrection. And that is painful, but it's good because God is a gracious, good and giving God. All right. I'd love to hear your comments. Love to hear more discussion on this and, you know, vote for me for president.